Greetings and welcome to the Greater Montcarry Missionary Baptist Church. We're glad that you have joined us on tonight for another Wednesday night word in the Lord, where the Lord is blessing, moving by his power, by his spirit, and by his anointing. God is doing great things, and he's truly worthy to be praised. We thank you for being a part of the Greater Montcarry Missionary Baptist Church, located 3835 Whitewater Road, right here in the city of Valdosta, Georgia. Why not share this broadcast, this telecast with a neighbor, friend, a co-worker on tonight. Amen. The link to join us is www.worshipwithmtcalvary.org forward slash live. And amen. We're glad that you have joined us on tonight. And if you would desire to give an offering or uh, you can download the application, give it a five. And the link to give is www.worshipwithmtcalvary.org forward slash giving. So we encourage you to be a part of our worship experience here at Calvary every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. where the Lord is doing great and awesome things and he's truly worthy to be praised. We honor God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, to our ministerial staff here at Mount Calvary, to their spouses, to my spouse, Lady Evelyn Diane Vincent, to our deacons, deaconess, mother, saints, and friends, to all of God's people around the world. Amen. We honor you and your respect to places. It's just good to come to you once again to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. God is doing great and awesome things, and truly, he is worthy to be praised. Let us pray at this time. I have the Father God, we thank you, God. We give you praise, God. We just give you glory for another chance, another opportunity to come and share your word with your people on tonight. And God, we pray that you would give them a word they stand in the need of God. Open up our ears and our hearts and our minds. Give us clarity, understanding your word. Give us teaching power that you will get the praise, you will get the glory, you will get the honor. Let this, breath, this broadcast bless your people, O oh Father God, and bless them in a mighty way. And Lord, enlarge their territory. Bless them indeed, O oh Father God, and keep them covered on your blood, on your power, on your anointing, all hurt, harm, or danger, seen unseen from the evil forces of the world, Father God. And Lord, look on those that are sick, those that are shedding, those that stand in the special prayer. You know what they crying out for and need you for, Father God. Heal, set free, and deliver right now, God. Bless in a mighty way. In the mighty name of Jesus, we put them in your hand and your tender care. In Christ Jesus' name we do pray. And thank you for the victory on every side. Amen and amen. Once again, God bless you. And thank you for joining the, the Mount Carey Missionary Baptist Church located at 3835 Whitewater Road right here in the city of Valdosta, Georgia. Amen. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. This is the month of February. Uh, we've been sharing with you about love. Amen. The topic about love. Amen. With you. Amen. Last week. And we want to come and talk to you about love again. Part number two. Paul thought it was necessary for the church. Amen. To, about love that he dedicated an entire chapter I mean, First Corinthians, the thirteenth chapter, dedicate that entire chapter towards love. And First Corinthians, the thirteenth and the thirteenth verse is the basis of our lesson. But the entire chapter, Amen. We'll be uh, going through and talking about in this series about love. He says in verse thirteen, and now about his faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is what charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Another version that just says the good news translation says, meanwhile, these three remain faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. And the greatest of these is love. Jesus is in the business of changing lives. Jesus life, death and resurrection, but not just about forgiveness, but enabling us to live lives of love. I need to say that again. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were not just about forgiveness, but enabling us to live lives of love. All you need is a desire to live a life of love and ask God for help. First Corinthians, uh, round about the first verse, say, I may be able to speak the language of men, of angels, but if I have not love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong of clinging bells. I may have the gift of inspired preaching. I may have all knowledge and understanding, all secrets 
I may have all the faith needed to move mountains. But if I have no love, I am nothing. I may give away everything I have and even give up my body to be burned. But if I have no love, this does me no good. Love is the central key to our lesson on tonight. Love. We got to have love. But if we don't have love, it does us no good. Love is important. Love, bang, bang, clang, clang. If we don't have any love, it's nothing but making a whole lot of noise, a whole lot of unnecessary noise. And we don't need to do that. We need the love of God in our lives. Uh, some of y'all remember the Beatles <clears throat> talked about love. They sang the song, All You Need Is Love, perhaps in the light of 1 Corinthians 13. They were not too far from the truth. Wednesday night, as we begin this journey on becoming complete in him, if you remember, I, tied, I, I talked about tongues and interpretation, uh, and, then, and we begin to talk about that. How you people talk about these things, but you can have all these gifts and all these uh, gifts, but not have love. It means nothing. And we need to seek God's face, and we need to show God's face, but we need to show love of God in our lives. <clears throat> Paul wrote this book, 13th chapter of the book of Corinthians, as a guideline for Christianity. He said, you don't have love, you are nothing. He said, if you don't have love, you are nothing. Bang, clang, clang, bang, bang, clang, clang. You don't have nothing. In the church at Corinthians, there was a lot of people mixed up about the really, the really important things in life. We talked about that, the church. We talking, we're not talking about a particular church. We're talking about the church in general. Even tonight, we're talking about the church in general. We're not talking about a particular church or a particular denomination. We're not trying to call out any specific church in our area or somewhere else. But we're talking about the church in general. These people had a lot of mix, uh, mixed up about the really important things in life. They were experiencing the power of God in many ways. They were speaking in tongues. They, they, they were interpreting. They had gifts of prophecy in, in general. The Holy Ghost was really moving in the early church. The problem was that people started to see various gifts as signs as they were more spiritual than everyone else. They thought it was better than somebody else. So the ones who spoke in tongues thought they were more spiritual than those who didn't. Paul writes and tells them how wrong they were saying God gives different gifts as he sees what fit. To one he might give the gifts of prophecy which does, doesn't mean foretelling the future but rather telling the church what they need to hear. To another he might give the gift of hospitality. Neither is any better than any other. The gifts are not marks of spirituality, but the sign of spirituality is love. Amen. The gifts are not marks of spirituality, but the sign of spirituality is what love. Now don't read into this message that we go too far the other way that we say that spiritual gifts don't matter. As long as you have love, Amen. As long as you have love in these gifts, that is what matter. Amen. We're not really looking at the gifts tonight. We'll do that possibly sometime later in the future. But we are looking at it as that whatever gifts you have, whatever you do, it needs to be energized and motivated by love. Whatever gifts you have and whatever you do for the Lord need to be energized and motivated what by love. Paul says here in chapter 13 that even if God gives you the gift of tongues, if you don't have love, you're, you're nothing with that gift. If you are a great theologian who understands God's head perfectly, or you can memorize the scriptures, or you can give your messages for the church and other people, if you don't love, have love, you are nothing. He even says that if you have great faith to move a mountain, and actually move, but don't have love, you are still nothing. 
even if you are giving great charity or being a great worker of charity, who sell all you have and give it to the poor. If you don't have love, you are nothing. You got to have love. Understanding Paul's list is not ex amen, exhaustive, but we could easily add to it. You can, can keep all the standards in the Pentecostal religion or in the church or the Baptist church or the Methodist church, whatever church you're in. If you don't have love, you are nothing. You can be used in the gifts of the spirit, but if you don't have love, you are nothing. Love is important, my brothers, and such is the key to being fulfilled, Christians showing the face of God. It's quite interesting to note a couple, a couple of Paul's example in this movement of faith listed one of the highest attributes that we need to see God. Faith is listed as a priority. No healing you didn't have if you didn't have faith. But when you look at First Corinthians thirteen, you find that love is greater than faith and hope. Amen. Love is greater than faith and hope. Paul says love is more important. That faith without love is nothing. Or what about giving to the poor? It's easy to see how preaching or speaking in tongues or something like that can be done without love, but you're giving it to the poor. Surely that is an existence of love. Yet Paul speaks of doing it without love is nothing. We can give out of duty because it's expected of us to look good in front of everyone else. Ananias and Amen. Remember Ananias? As far as uh, I mean, they died because they were trying to act like they were giving to the poor, but deep down inside they were doing it for exposure. Amen. They weren't doing it out of love. John Wesley, one of the key characters in the great Reformation, described holiness as a perfect love, not rule keeping, not a list of do's and don'ts, but perfect love. It was about everything you do being motivated by love. Love is the heart of Christianity. We spend so much time fighting and trying to prove what's wrong and what's right and wrong. And all the time, God saying, I want you to have your com be complete in love. We, we worry about everything else, <clears throat> but we need to be concerned about our completion and complete in love. We show, we show the church how we can see the face of God. The message says, seek the face and I will show you my face. When we get true love flowing inside of us, then we become what the image of God. We were made in this image in the beginning. And when we walk in God, which is love, and we read in our last week in First John, the fourth chapter, and then we begin to see him face to face by looking in the mirror and seeing the reflection of God, which is God is love. This is how you see God, but it does not mean, amen, how do we love today? For the next few uh, weeks, we're going to dissect First Corinthians and see what love is and what love is not. See what love is and what love is not. But what is love? What does Paul mean by love? What? Well, he goes on to tell us, he lists things and says love is or love is not. What are we to make of these qualities? What are we to do with them? Another person, Tom Wright, suggests one outline for following through these qualities that I think is very helpful. He suggests a three steps to look at it. In what ways did Jesus show these qualities? In what ways do we show or not show these qualities? And in what situation should we be on the lookout for to act like this? This evening, we're going to look at, amen, to make these possible suggestions for two Per, number one, then make possible suggestions for two and three. But the real work is in uh, number two and three, in what ways we show or not show these qualities and in what situation we should be on the lookout for to act like this. Amen. You need to know this for yourself. Only you can look at your own life and evaluate it, not nobody else. We need to look, we need to work out for our, yourself where we need to all grow. I say where we need to all grow. Developing this lifestyle <clears throat> can take a lifetime and with many missteps along the way. But as long as we recognize them as mistakes and repent, rather than clinging to them, then we are making what progress. 
It is also what God wants us and expect us to do to make progress. We want to start on the list. It is important to remember one thing about love in this passage. Love is not just an emotion. It is a conscious decision of the will to put others' needs before our own. Love is not just an emotion. It is a conscious decision of, of the will to put others' needs before our own. In some cases, this may be accomplished by feeling or an emotion. But this, that is not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about the action, the decision of the will of man. Verse number four, of First Corinthians 13 chapter, he said, love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is patient. Love is patient. Firstly, Jesus. The number one thought on this one that sprang to my mind was Jesus with the disciples. They followed Jesus around for three years. They heard all of his teaching. They saw all the miracles they had. Jesus' private teaching and explanation that they were with him alone. They still did not get it. It was the chief priest that saw Jesus talk about the resurrection and posted the guard at the, on the tomb while the disciples forgot everything and thought that, amen, his death was the end. One, one minute, a Peter can call Jesus the Messiah and the next he proves that he really doesn't get what that means. Even after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. The Bible says in Matthew 28 that some still doubt it. And yet, <clears throat> yet through all this unbelief, this stubbornness, this just not, they just not getting it. Jesus is still what? Patient. Love is patient. He doesn't give up on them. He doesn't stop trying to teach them. He does say, you're never going to get this. He, no matter how clearly I explain it to you, you're going, not you're never going to understand him who re I'm really, who I really am. Look, just forget it. it. I'll start again in with a brighter bunch. No, his love is what? Patience. His love is patience. We notice also in his dealing with the sinners and the religious leaders, he was what? Patient. So what about us? Are we patient? Love is patient. It's not just about much talking about being patient with things, although this is good too, but being patient with people. Now, some of us are naturally this way. And some of us are not. I'm, I am the most, sometimes people say they're the most impatient person in the world. They cannot stand the wait in a long line for something in meetings. They're the first one to get their books together and leave. They, they, stand, they can't stand to spend time with people that just can't get get my point and they, they have to they have a lot to work on to get there and we are just on the first one the biggest downfall of the christianity is that people don't believe the way they do they're going to hell they don't want to conform they are going to hell we are condemning people because we don't have the patience to show them the way we must have patience love is patience it is patient with people who are wrong and are not willing to see the truth. There are some people who are not going to believe like you. Get over it. Love is patient. We cannot change a person. But when we have the attributes of God, it's something about the glory of God that can change a person. When love, as Christ loved the church, we put on the face and the countenance of God. When people see God face to face, they can't help but to surrender to him love is patient it's about being patient with those who don't meet our standards it's about being patient and giving God time to work love it's about being patient with people and earning their respect so that they will be willing to listen to what we have to say keep in mind just because you say something don't mean they will believe it let God work in their lives of people and you just keep moving as God wants to, amen, wants you to love. Love is patient. Remember, standard is not salvation. If people don't want to live by your standards and the church standards, then who are we to condemn them? We must love through patience. 
There are some of the applications from my life and your life. What are yours? This is for you to discover what God wants you to apply to your life and what's going on in your life. But we must understand that love is patient. Amen. Love is patient. Paul says too in chapter 13, love is kind. Love is kind. This one seems the easier to deal with. We know what it means to be kind to each other. Amen. It's another way of saying to do to others as you would have them to do to you. Not to do to others as you expect them to do to you, but as you would like them to do. Being kind means, amen, to give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't always think the worst of them. It means you have the power or the ability to help someone, then do it. It means don't be cruel. It means do to do something for someone not because you must or you're required to, but just because you want to. It means being nice in the way to treat people instead of being nasty, to show compassion, to be kind. Jesus was kind. He was the one who treated the Samaritan woman as a person and not as an inferior because she was a woman not as unclean or an enemy because she was a Samaritan. He was kind to the sick because he healed them. He was kind to the crowds because he fed them rather than sending them away. Jesus was kind. Love is kind. So how do we measure up? Are we kind to people? Other describes as kind. Can you can the way we deal with others be described as being kind? That's really not for you to say. Not a lot to say on this one. We know when we are being kind to others, we treat them kindly. It's more of a question of doing it. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love does not envy. Mm. Love does not envy. Paul talking to us tonight. Love does not envy. Here we back to the to the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. It basically means the same thing. Some, someone else has something really nice that you don't have. It's only human nature to want it and feel annoyed that you, they have it and you don't. But the thing is, Jesus died to empower us to overcome this what, human nature. Jesus was the most unenvious person you can imagine. He had nothing. No place to call his home. No place to sleep at night. Yet he hung about the people who had plenty, rich people. Yet not once we find him asking people to give him money to let him continue his ministry like modern uh, evangelists do today. We have no trace that he envied those around him. In fact, uh, if anything, he felt sorry for them. He pitied them, saying it was hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven, but it goes beyond that. Philippians 2 reminds us we find that Jesus was God who had everything at his fingertips, gladly gave up all his privileges as God and became human and poor human at that and ultimately died on the cross. A symbol of shame and failure as well as his excusing excusing pain and suffering. This was not someone who envied. This was someone who had it all yet gave it all up because he loved us. Jesus was someone who had it all, but yet gave it all up because he loved us. There was no envy in Jesus. Love, love does not envy. But what about us? I have to say, I, some of us have fallen prey to this one from time to time. The other churches in town who are beginning to do things that we have done, and now some of them are doing things that we want to do. We've caught ourselves, we fought ourselves getting in this, getting our, getting in our feelings like I have to keep up. But God has smote us and said to us, my spirit is not what you can do to expose yourself to others in the community. My spirit is what you can do to expose yourself what, to me. It is not about us getting exposure as a people, but we exposing ourselves to God and showing for the love of God. We don't end because we love Imagine that instead of being someone who else who really who gets the really, really good thing you want, it's your kids. Suddenly you're happy that they have it 
and does it really matter that you don't? Why? Because you love the person who has it and you're happy for them. When you love someone else, you consider their needs to be more important than yours. So if someone else is getting, you should be happy. We should not envy someone else that is being blessed and prospering because why? We do not envy. We should be happy. Love, do not envy. We should be happy for others' progress, others' blessing, others moving forward, others, amen, being blessed by God. Just as we see kids, seeing other kids receive different gifts and things, we should not, amen, we should be a kid that are happy for other kids and that we can participate because if God got them their blessing, that means he's in the neighborhood to give us our blessing and our breakthrough. Love does not envy. How do we apply this to ourselves? Where are we falling down with this one? Where do we need more work at in this area? Where are you actually at in doing this? Amen. We said on tonight, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. I said love does not envy. And we don't need to have to be envy, have envy in our heart. And the conclusion of this lesson, love is the key to our Christianity. And as First John says, we love because God what first loved us. God is what love. And we should love too. What does love mean? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy that's not all that is to love. If we only begin to look at it, oh, it just gets even deeper and deeper. We have not seen how love is just to be and just stand up against evil. So this is not the final word on love, but it's just the beginning of a start. I want to remind you of the challenge that we talked about earlier uh, of Tom Wright. How did Jesus show this aspect of love? And how do we show or not show this aspect of love? And how can you plan for the future to do better? How can you plan for the future to love better? Is there someone this week that you can plan to be patient with? That you can plan to be kind to? That you can plan not to be envious of? What are you going to do with the love that God has given to you. If you just think about it, it's actually really, really hard if we can't do it. But Jesus is in the business of changing lives. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were not just about forgiveness for past sins, but was about enabling us to live lives of love. I need to say that again. Jesus' life and death and resurrection, resurrection was not just about forgiveness for past sins, but about enabling us, amen, to live lives of love. All that is needed is a desire to live a life of love and to ask God for his help, and he will surely provide it. I encourage you. Amen. In your Bible reading time, read the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 chapter and 1 John the 4th chapter on the coming week. And get even deeper into this thing that we call love. Paul said, if we don't have love, we are nothing but a bunch of noisy people. A noisy gong or clinging bell. Love Bang, bang, clang, clang. We need the love of God in our life. Love is patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is kind. Love, amen, does not envy just a little bit tonight about love. God bless you and heaven keep you is our prayer. If you're not saved tonight and need to know the Lord and the partner of your sin, I invite you to meet Jesus the Christ. 
He's willing, he's able to save you. All you got to do is simply say this prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive for all my sins and my transgressions. I receive you as Lord of my life and my Savior and my Redeemer. I want to live for you. I want to walk in your path. I want to be your child. Lord, receive me and I accept you into my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's simple as that. God bless you. Heaven keep you is our prayer. We hope that we have said something tonight in this lesson part two of love. Bang, bang, clang, clang. Don't be just a noisy person, empty person, not having nothing, but let love be a part of everything that you do in your life. Father, we thank you. Father, we give you praise. God, we give you glory. We give you honor tonight. Blessed is your people on tonight. God, you know what they have standing in need of right now. Just touch it from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet. Bless them indeed. Open large their territory, God. God. He'll set free and deliver, God. God, look on the bereaved family. Touch them today, oh God, in the hour of loss. They'll be with your people in a special way, God. You know what they have, what they stand in the need of right now, Father God. And God, we pray you turn it around in their favor, Father God. In the mighty name of you, put them in your hand and your tender care. You got all power in your hand. You can do anything but fear. We thank you for the victory on every side. In the mighty name of Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest rule in the Bible with you henceforth now and forever. And all God people say, Amen. God bless you. And remember, you don't have any trouble, but all you need is faith in God. Until the next time, be blessed and highly favored in the Lord.